By 1944, 550,000 people had already been murdered here at Auschwitz. But now, during just a few weeks in spring and early summer, that figure was to increase by over 300,000. Four years after it first opened, a period of frenzied killing was to begin at Auschwitz, unlike anything the camp had yet seen. But the history of Auschwitz in 1944 is not just one of murder. There is also intrigue. For this was also the year that the Nazis sent unlikely messengers to neutral territory to try to sow seeds of confusion among the Allies. Versteht ihr, worum es sich handelt, Genossen? Den Deutschen brennt der Boden unter den Füßen. Sie fühlen das Namen der Katastrophe. Sie wollen verhandeln. And as the Allies learnt more about Auschwitz, the pressure on them grew. What were they going to do about it? We wanted them to, to put bombs on the camp. Hundreds and hundreds of planes coming, and we are looking bomb up and no bombs. This is the story of Auschwitz, the Nazis and the Allies in 1944. One of death, deceit, and mystery. The vast majority of those who were murdered at Auschwitz in 1944 came from one place, Hungary. In March 1944, German troops entered Budapest. For the Nazis, Hungary was a rich country, ripe for plunder. And though already allied to the Nazis, the Hungarians had been unreliable partners as far as Hitler was concerned, not least in their refusal to deport the 760,000 Hungarian Jews. Shortly after they were established in Budapest, the SS called a Hungarian named Joel Brandt, one of the most politically active members of the Jewish community, in for a meeting. On the 25th of April, 1944, he went to see SS Lieutenant Colonel Adolf Eichmann. We know what was said from Brandt's subsequent interrogation by British intelligence, as well as his post-war testimony. Eichmann, infamous for organizing the mass murder of the Jews, was about to make a surprising proposal to Brandt. Ich habe Sie kommen lassen, weil ich Ihnen ein Geschäft vorschlagen möchte. Ich kann Ihnen eine Million Juden verkaufen. Was wollen Sie? Erzeugungsfähige Männer, gebärfähige Frauen, Kinder, Greise. Wir nehmen es Platz. Herr Obersturmbannführer, Sie verlangen von mir zu entscheiden, wer am Leben bleiben soll und wer nicht. Das kann ich nicht. Ich will keinen einzigen Menschen meines Volkes verlieren. Herr Brandt, ich kann Ihnen nicht alle Juden Europas verkaufen. Aber eine Million Juden kann ich laufen lassen. Wir sind an Waren interessiert, nicht an Geld. Fahren Sie ins Ausland... Stellen Sie Kontakt zu Ihrer internationalen Führung und zu den Alliierten her und bringen Sie mir eine konkrete Offerte mit zurück. We tried to understand what was going on. It was possible that the Germans were just bluffing us. But we couldn't understand why. But events elsewhere cast doubt on the Nazis' genuine desire to sell the Hungarian Jews, because this man, SS Lieutenant Colonel Rudolf Huss, was returning to Auschwitz. Huss had been removed as the original commandant of Auschwitz the previous November, promoted to a job in Berlin. But now he'd been ordered to return to the camp, 
to oversee the murder of the Hungarian Jews. At Auschwitz's main camp, Hörs, a committed Nazi, held planning meetings with his senior staff. Wir werden uns auf Transportzahlen vorbereiten müssen. Auschwitz became the greatest human extermination center of all time. The reasons behind the extermination program seem to me to be right. There's nothing new in anti-Semitism. It's always existed all over the world. It's only come into the limelight where the Jews have pushed themselves forward too much in their quest for power. Fueled partly by these prejudices, Hearst prepared for the arrival of the Hungarian Jews at Auschwitz-Birkenau, two miles away from Auschwitz's main camp. He oversaw the completion of a railway line, allowing new arrivals to be brought directly into Birkenau. Birkenau, part concentration camp, part extermination center, had been the site of mass murder at Auschwitz since 1942. Here, not just Jews, but Polish political prisoners and others the Nazis thought a threat to their rule were imprisoned. Crucial to the operation of Birkenau were four crematoria with gas chambers attached, where those selected to die were murdered and burnt. To czego nie można pokazać, a szczególnie w Brzezince, bo to się tam działo. What can't be shown, especially in Birkenau, is above all the stench of burning bodies. Ten swąd palący się ciał. To szło it spread a long way, kilometers from the camp. It wasn't just that the fire burnt for one day, went out, and that was it. It burnt for months on end. Whether it rained or not, whether it snowed or not, the fire burned all the time. Hus and his SS colleagues now anticipated that so many people were about to be murdered here, the crematoria ovens simply would not cope so huge cremation pits were prepared. And one prominent visitor to Auschwitz during May 1944 was none other than Adolf Eichmann. Hurst yeah. knew him well. Eichmann was completely obsessed with his mission and also convinced that this extermination action was necessary in order to preserve the German people in the future from the destructive intentions of the Jews. Eichmann's visit, I remember. His whole appearance. All the SS people had the same expression. They were always furious looking, to show how important they were, to show they were important people. Yet at the same time as organizing the deportation of the Hungarian Jews, Eichmann allowed Brandt to leave Hungary on the 17th of May 1944. His task, to see if the Allies would exchange 10,000 trucks for one million Jews. There was considerable urgency to Brandt's mission, because in Hungary the deportations were already underway. a task now performed with the essential cooperation of the Hungarian authorities. In the small town of Sharvar, close to the border with Austria, Alice Lok Kahana, her elder sister Edith, and the rest of their family prepared to leave. The scene of, of going out of Egypt came to my mind. When we saw the cattle trains, I told, my sister, it's a mistake. They, they have cattle trains here. They don't mean we should go in cattle trains. So we found ourselves in the cattle train. They're closing the door on us and they're leaving a bucket for sanitary use and a bucket for water. And I told Edith, I will never use 
the sanitary used bucket in front of these people, no matter what happens to me. And the two of us went to the corner of the cattle train. Joel Brandt arrived at Istanbul in neutral Turkey on the 19th of May. He met representatives of various groups with links to the Jewish leadership in Palestine at the Pera Palace Hotel. Versteht ihr, worum es sich handelt, Genossen? Den Deutschen brennt der Boden unter den Füßen. Sie fühlen das Namen der Katastrophe. Sie wollen verhandeln. Ich verstehe nicht, warum kein einziger von der Exekutive in Jerusalem hier ist. Es handelt sich um Tage, um Stunden. Eichmann wartet nicht. Täglich werden 12.000 in die Waggons geschleppt. Wir müssen sofort nach Jerusalem telegrafieren und darauf bestehen, dass ein Mann kommt, dessen Name in der Welt bekannt ist. Chaim Weizmann oder Moshe Schertok. Joel, äh, solche Sachen kommen nicht telegrafisch der Leidigen. Wir sind nicht sicher, dass sie unsere Telegramme kommen zu der Zeit und sie nicht verändert. Wir müssen einen Boten schicken. Übermorgen geht ein Zug. Aber das dauert zu lange. Warum nicht per Flugzeug? Warum nicht heute Nacht? Du stellst dir das vielleicht vor, Joel. Wir bekommen kein Flugzeug. While Brandt encountered the first difficulties with his mission, the Hungarian Jews were arriving at Auschwitz-Birkenau. As a general rule, the taking of photographs was prohibited at Auschwitz. But one member of the SS did record the arrival of this Hungarian transport. No one knows why these pictures were taken, but they constitute the most valuable visual record in existence of what happened here. The Nazis wanted to see who could work as forced labor and who could not. The first part of this selection process was to separate the women and children from the men and then to choose from within each group who should die at once. When we arrived, I told Edith, nothing can be so bad like this cattle trade. I'm sure they will want us to work. And for the children, they will give better food. So they're saying right now, the children should separate, go in another um, uh, group, go line up with the children. Alice, who arrived at Auschwitz with her family on a similar transport to this, had decided to stand with the mothers and children. She could not have picked a more dangerous spot. And I went to that group with the children. And I was very tall for my age, and suddenly the, a German soldier asked me, haben Sie Kinder? Do you have children? And I said, no, I am just 15 in German. And then he put me to another group. That moment saved her life. Alice was taken from the group with mothers and children, all of whom were selected for immediate murder, and was placed with fit and healthy young women who were chosen as slave labor. The moment of selection captured in these photographs took only seconds. It was a procedure every new Jewish arrival endured. Zemmer was separating us when he was looking at the old people. They put them to the right and the young people to the left. So this way they separated us. The right lane, they took him right away to the gas chambers. Family was done already. It was down to the crematorium. You know, they perish right away. You know when they take uh, direct uh, to the crematorium after a couple of hours, you don't exist anymore.
On average, 75% of the people on each transport from Hungary were selected to be murdered straight away. As the transports continued to Auschwitz, Joel Brandt travelled to Aleppo in Syria and on the 11th of June 1944 met with a representative of the Jewish agency. Also present was a major from British counterintelligence who recorded the conversation. Brandt was about to hear bad news. What would happen if you didn't go to Budapest? Genosse Schertok, then all the Jews in Hungary will be brought to Hungary. Nach zwei Monaten wird von uns ebenso viel übrig bleiben wie vom Warschauer Ghetto. Lieber Joel, ich muss dir leider etwas Bitteres sagen. Du kannst nicht zurück nach Budapest. Die Engländer verlangen, dass du nach Kairo weiterfährst. Heißt das, die Engländer halten mich gefangen? Ja. Wisst ihr, was ihr da tut? Das ist doch einfach Mord. Wenn ich nicht zurückkehre, werden unsere Leute geschlachtet. Meine Frau, meine Mutter, meine Kinder kommen als Erste dran. Ich bin als Parlamentär gekommen. Aber ich bin nicht der Abgesandte des Feindes. Die Deutschen sind meine Feinde ebenso wie die der Alliierten. Ich bin hier der Abgesandte von einer Million zum Tode verurteilter Menschen. Von meiner Rückkehr hängt ihr Leben ab. Wer gibt euch das Recht, mich zu verhaften? Was habe ich gegen England getan? The British believed they knew why the Nazis now proposed a deal. The Germans were losing the war. The Red Army was marching on the right. And the Nazis said the trucks they wanted in exchange for Jews would be used only on the Eastern Front in the war against the Soviet Union. Heinrich Himmler of the SS, who was behind the Brandt mission, wanted to split the Allies. On May the 31st, 1944, at the Foreign Office in London, the Brandt proposals were considered by a committee of the War Cabinet. Their conclusion was that the idea of exchanging trucks for Jews was blackmail and should be rejected. But during the discussion, there was another less idealistic reason suggested to refuse the Nazis' offer, which was that to accept it might lead to an offer to unload an even greater number of Jews onto our hands. Shortly after the British decision, the Americans and Soviets also agreed that there should be no negotiations with the Nazis. The Germans kept repeating that the Jews are almighty, that the Jews rule the world. They kept saying America and England do whatever Jews ask, but we could see that that wasn't true. Meanwhile, the Allies did not communicate their rejection of the Brandt mission to the Nazis here in Budapest. So Brandt's wife, Hansi, together with Rudolf Kastner, another Jewish activist, was able to plead repeatedly with Adolf Eichmann for a gesture that would show the Nazis were prepared to negotiate with the Allies. Both Rudolf Kastner and Hansi Brandt later testified as to how the meetings went. Warum verschonen Sie denn nicht, wenn ich stens die Kinder hier Oberstub mal führe? Wir könnten Ihnen zusichern, dass wir uns um Sie kümmern werden. Jetzt verstehen Sie mich doch einmal. Ich muss diesen jüdischen Dreck aus der Provinz ausräumen. Da hilft kein Argument und da hilft auch kein Weinen. Sie haben wahrscheinlich keine Kinder. Und deshalb haben Sie auch kein Mitleid mit ihnen. Sie nehmen sicher einiges heraus, Frau Brandt. Ich rate Ihnen, wenn Sie weiterhin so mit mir reden wollen, sich lieber bei mir nicht mehr blicken zu lassen. Auf Wiedersehen. Wiedersehen, Herr Oberstubafir. Eichmann was not prepared to spare one person's life as a result of humanitarian pleas. But he and his SS colleagues were prepared to listen to another argument. Ein 
They announced that one train full of Jews could leave Budapest for a safe destination as a so-called gesture of good faith. The price per seat on the train, 1,000 US dollars. On the 30th of June, 1944, a train containing 1,684 Hungarian Jews pulled out of a Budapest station. A special committee on which Rudolf Kastner sat had decided the final passenger list. The Kastner list was compiled on purpose, like a Noah's, Noah's Ark. Everybody and everything should be represented. If this will be the only part of Jews of Europe who remain alive, there should be a representative portion. But this was a strange Noah's Ark. Massively overrepresented on the train were Kastner's own relatives and people from his hometown of Koloshvar. And places were also given to several hundred rich Hungarian Jews who subsidized anyone on the train who couldn't pay. If you have to save your life, you try it in every way, even in a criminal way if it comes to that. But you have to save your, your life is the first. You are nearest to yourself, whatever you <laughs> try to say. And when we were in the, in the train, we were afraid. We never knew what will be our future. Eichmann had promised that the train would travel to neutral Switzerland, but it didn't. At Linz in Austria, the train stopped and Jews on board were told to get out and take a shower. I was standing naked before the doctor and still looking very proud into his eyes and uh, thought he should see how a Jewish woman is going, a proud Jewish woman is going to die. Because most of us knew that in Auschwitz and from the taps there didn't come any water but the gas. And uh, from the taps came fine warm water. Afterwards, we dressed up and returned to our train. It was a very relieving experience after we were ready to die there. The train traveled on to Bergen-Belsen camp in Germany, where those on board stayed for up to six months before the Nazis finally allowed almost all of them to travel to neutral Switzerland. The 1,600 Jews who had left on the Kastner train in June represented less than half of 1% of the Hungarian Jews deported to Auschwitz. The spring and early summer of 1944 was to be the most notorious period in the history of the camp. The four crematoria with gas chambers were struggling to cope with the numbers the Nazis wanted to kill. Two of them lay here, in the western part of the Birkenau complex, with the gas chambers above ground. Two more were positioned close to the railway line that took new arrivals into the heart of Birkenau. These had the gas chambers in the basement. The Nazis had hugely increased the number of Jewish prisoners in the Zonderkommando they made work in the crematoria in order to deal with the massive numbers they wished to murder. So much so that a crematorium and gas chamber like this was operated by around 100 Jews and just four Germans. The torment endured by the Zonderkommando, forced on pain of their own immediate death to assist in the killing process, is one of the most shocking parts of the history of Auschwitz. When people was in that gas chamber, you could hear some kind of a voice calling God. It looked like those voices coming from kind of a catacombs, which I still got them, those kind of voices, I still got them in my ears. These wire columns contained the Zyklon B gas pellets, which were lowered in from above by the Nazis. And while it was always the Nazis themselves who committed this act of murder, 
It was the prisoners of the Zonda Commando who had to perform the horrendous task of collecting the bodies, taking them out and up a small lift to burn, either in the ovens of the crematorium or increasingly in the open air. When the, the big, you know, transports from uh, uh, Hungary came in, then were daily, you know, on, they wanted to finish them fast. That's why they had the pits to, to go through. This photograph, which a Zonda commando risked his life to take, shows bodies lying by the open cremation pits in 1944. Every day is uh, burning dead bodies every day, every day, every day. You got used to it. We knew it. If we won't do that, we had a bullet in our head. It was like a robot. On occasion, when killing small numbers of prisoners, the gas chambers were not used, and the Zonda Commando were forced to stand just inches away from the murders. We, we had to take them. They bring one by one. We take them by the ears, and be, behind him was a, an SS. Shoot him in the back. The guy would, would come down with a lot of blood. Was some of us there with the water putting out. After a while, you don't know, nothing, nothing, nothing bothers you. That's why your conscience, you know, gets inside of you and stays there until today. You know, somebody else is inside of me that tells me from time to time you get awake, what happened, why we did such a thing. By now, the Allies knew about this place and its role as an extermination camp. Gradually, from early 1944 onwards, the level of knowledge about what was happening here had been increasing among the Allies, thanks to the escape of a handful of Auschwitz prisoners and the work of the Polish resistance. This culminated in a document which drew together the available intelligence and which came to be known as the Auschwitz Protocols. It included sketches showing the position of the major crematoria and gas chambers at Birkenau. As a result, from June 1944, Jewish organizations asked that the railway lines to Auschwitz and the gas chambers of the camp be bombed. Requests which reached the American government only a few weeks after the landings on the D-Day beaches. Assistant Secretary of State John McCloy rejected the request, saying the bombing was impracticable and would lead to diversion of considerable air support that was essential elsewhere. A clue as to the strength of McCloy's opposition to the bombing requests comes from this inter-office memo, where his own assistant, Colonel Gerhardt, writes, I know you told me to kill this. In Britain, requests to bomb Auschwitz were once again referred to the Americans, and so the idea died. But the Americans went on in August 1944 to bomb the IG Farben factory being built at Monowitz, just four miles from Birkenau. We heard the airplanes coming, and we, we wanted them to, to put bombs on the camp. At least we could run, and hundreds and hundreds of planes coming, and we are looking bomb up and no bombs. So this we couldn't understand. So absolutely God forgot us, and the people of the world forgot that, didn't care about what's going on, and they knew what's going on there. During a reconnaissance flight on the 25th of August, the Americans took this picture of Auschwitz-Birkenau. Whether or not, of course, it would have ever been possible to destroy with a precision attack the crematoria and gas chambers, clearly visible here, and whether that would have made the Nazis stop committing murder at Auschwitz, is one of the great unanswered questions of history.
What is certain is that back in Budapest, the protests about the deportations made by several foreign governments, including the British and Americans, did have an effect. The pressure reached a peak in early July, when the Hungarians intercepted cables demanding that those involved be punished. The Hungarian Prime Minister, de Mestoyai, and Edmund Wesenmayer, Hitler's representative in Hungary, met to discuss the intercepts. We know what was said from a detailed report Wesenmayer sent the next day to Berlin. Und dann haben wir noch ein anderes Telegramm abgefangen, in dem 70 ungarische und deutsche Persönlichkeiten namentlich genannt werden, die als hauptverantwortlich für die Deportationen angesehen werden. Hm. Da ist mein Name dabei. Und Ihrer natürlich auch. Mich persönlich lassen diese Drogen kalt. But such protests and threats from the international community did influence the Hungarian head of state, Admiral Horthy. With the war clearly going against the Nazis, he decided that the time had come to distance himself from his erstwhile ally. Horthy informed the Germans on the 7th of July that the deportations of the Jews must cease. The Hungarian authorities would no longer cooperate. After the official halt of the Hungarian transports, the Nazis at Auschwitz focused greater attention on inmates who had been imprisoned here at Birkenau for some time, the gypsies. They lived in family groups, in some of the worst conditions in the camp. The atmosphere was terrible because many of the small children and people in the blocks were ill and everyone was mixed up together. Children were screaming, Mom, I'm hungry, give me something to eat or something to drink. But they weren't allowed to drink the water due to typhus. Franz Rosenbach survived only because he was eventually transferred elsewhere as slave labor. But his mother died at Auschwitz, along with 21,000 of the 23,000 gypsies sent there. You see, there were moments, moments which one really prefers not to think about. Such moments. The things that were done to us left you wondering why. We were beaten, kicked, degraded, but you didn't know why. You had no idea why. Simply because we were different. Under Nazi rule, the gypsies suffered proportionately more than any other group apart from the Jews. The Nazis considered them antisocial, despised their way of life, and thought them racially dangerous. On the evening of the 2nd of August, 1944, the Nazis moved to liquidate the gypsy camp. It was to be one of the most appalling single nights in the history of Auschwitz. The gypsy camp was very close to our barrack, and we could hear it. And the night was unbelievable full of screaming and crying and smoke and horrendous sounds. They took the gypsies and the gypsies were crying. They knew where they are taking them. Everybody defended themselves, defended themselves to the last. They bit, they scratched, 
the Germans had driven in in trucks. They threw the children in them, and if one of them jumped out, they would hit him on the leg or the arm with a wooden club, break it and throw him back in, so that he couldn't jump out again, couldn't get out because his limb was just hanging there. And when I saw this, I started yelling, and people grabbed me, poles, as they were afraid that the Germans would come and throw a hand grenade in or something. They rolled me in a blanket to keep me quiet and sat with me. The gypsies were taken to the crematoria, many here to crematorium five, and killed within its network of gas chambers. By the autumn of 1944, after the gypsies had been murdered here, and the massive transports of Jews from Hungary and then the Lodz ghetto in Poland had ceased, the number of people killed at Auschwitz dropped to fewer than 1,000 a day from a peak of 10,000 in May. The Zonderkommando who worked in these gas chambers now began to fear for their own lives. They were changing us. You know, we, we knew that uh, our days were always numbered and we didn't know when the end would be. Here in Crematorium 4, at around 1.30 p.m. on Saturday the 7th of October, 1944, the Zonderkommando fought back. They set fire to the crematorium, and armed with pickaxes and rocks, they attacked their SS guards. Meanwhile, the Zonderkommando in Crematorium 2 also rose up. After a few minutes of hand-to-hand -hand fighting with the SS, some Zonderkommando managed to escape into the nearby woods but all of them were later captured and shot. And the SS even sought revenge against those Zonderkommando who had not taken part in the revolt. They didn't know what to do with us. So they had a kind of discussion, and then they told us to lie face down on the ground, holding our hands behind our backs, and every third person was shot. Some of my friends in the Zonda Commando lost their lives and the rest of us had to go back to work. There was never much hope for us. I'm telling it like it is. They didn't kill us because there were 4,000 cadavers, you know, that we have to go into the ovens and we are the only ones that they could do it, and uh, that's why they save us. But after that, they, they took most of us, they left only 92 of us. All the others, they took them and they killed them all around. The same month as the Zonderkommando revolt, there was a coup in Hungary. On the 15th of October, 1944, Horty's non-compliant regime was overthrown by the Nazi-backed Arrow Cross militia. Eichmann immediately called Rudolf Kastner in for a meeting. Kastner later wrote a report about what was discussed. Schanz, ich bin wieder da. Jetzt passen Sie mal auf. Diese neue Regierung arbeitet jetzt nach unseren Befehlen. Und jetzt werden die Budapester Juden abtransportiert. Und zwar diesmal zu Fuß. The Jews of Budapest, who had up to now largely escaped deportation, were now Eichmann's target. They were not to be sent to Auschwitz, but to Austria, where they would be used as slave labor. And because of the shortage of trains, they were to walk there. So during November, tens of thousands of Jews from Budapest were forced out of the city and made to trek west. Many thousands died en route. But Eichmann incurred the displeasure of senior figures of the SS, concerned in the light of how badly the war was going for them that so much potential forced labor was being squandered. And so Himmler summoned Eichmann to a special meeting in December 1944 on his private train. 
Obergruppenführer Jüttner hat sich über die unhaltbaren Zustände der Fußmärsche aus Budapest beschwert. Ich mache Sie, Oberstobernführer, dafür verantwortlich, dass so etwas nicht wieder vorkommt. Another SS officer, Lieutenant Colonel Becher, who also worked in Hungary, was present as well. Reichsführer, die Fußmärsche wurden in Abstimmung mit Gruppenführer Müller veranlasst. After the war, Becher testified as to what was said. Obersturmanführer, kommen Sie mir nicht mit Ausflüchten. Wenn Sie bisher Juden ausrotteten, so haben Sie, wenn ich es befehle, wie in diesem Falle, jetzt Judenpfleger zu sein. Ich erinnere Sie daran, dass nicht der Gruppenführer Müller oder Sie, sondern ich das Reichssicherheitshauptamt gegründet habe. Und dass ich befehle. Wenn Sie es nicht können, dann müssen Sie es sagen. Jawohl, Reichsführer. Himmler knew the German army was struggling to hold back the Allies. And by January 1945, the SS here at Auschwitz were also well aware that the end was near. All reference to this place as a site of mass murder was to be eliminated. We woke up in the middle of the night to the sound of explosion. They were blowing up the gas chamber, the crematorium. Outside, the SS were waiting for us and ordered us to march. Anybody who could not march fast enough was shot on the spot. We arrived in Auschwitz I, which is about an hour walk at 1 a.m. The Nazis again disappeared as if the earth swallowed them up. Eva Moses' corps and 1,200 other prisoners thought too weak to evacuate from the area were now left for a few days to fend for themselves at Auschwitz' main camp. Most of the guards had gone, but another SS unit had been ordered to come to the camp and shoot them. No prisoners were supposed to be left alive to testify to just what had happened here. Meanwhile, more than 50,000 other inmates of Auschwitz, thought fit enough to become slave laborers, were marched in sub-zero temperatures to railway junctions, where they were to be put on trains and sent west. If anyone even dared to bend down to get muddy snow off their shoes, they were shot. That was the end. We weren't allowed to bend over. We could only walk quickly, quickly, quickly. On both sides of the roads, there were ditches, big ditches. And the ditches were full of bodies. Also on the march amidst the chaos of this retreat, were prisoners who had never thought they could possibly leave the camp alive, the Zonder commander. We survived that because the Russians were coming from Krakow and down, and the, the uh, Germans got panicky. And every place we went, <clears throat> the Germans, one by one, were asking us if you work in the Zonder commando, and we were shot. Once they reached the railhead, the Auschwitz prisoners were crammed into open wagons to continue the journey west, in temperatures that could reach as low as minus 20 degrees. So all the wagons was very packed. And one guy was up, and he was German. He told us he was German. Who knows, maybe a convict, who knows? And he wanted to sit down. He couldn't stand up no more, this guy. So, and he told me, uh, I got some cigarettes. Would you let me sit down? When I heard cigarettes, you know that. <laughs> when I heard some cigarettes, I said, he gave me two, three cigarettes. I got up and he sat. So the cigarettes in five, ten minutes was gone. I told, we told him, get up. Get up. Stand up. He won't stand up. So what I did was, me and a couple more friends, we sit on him. 
in about 30 minutes, one hour, he was suffocated, that guy, and we threw, threw it out of the wagon. I was happy. How did I feel? They killed all my family, about 30, 40 people of my family, and I killed one German? That was nothing. It was a murder, wasn't it? You did murder a fellow prisoner. I was, I was happy at the time, I told you, because he was German. I won't do that to I won't do that to one of, of ours. But anyway, I wanted to be seated too over there because I got tired too. Why he should leave? Because he gave me two, three cigarettes. That's why he didn't want to get up, so we sit on him. And he passed away. Easy. So can I euch nur meinen letzten Befehl geben? The Germans who were actually complicit in the murders at Auschwitz knew they were even more at risk from retribution as the war neared its end. My lieber Brandt, danke für alles. Members of the SS, like Rudolf Höss, the former commandant of Auschwitz, now tried to escape capture. And the story of Höss and his colleagues' attempt to evade justice and the Allied attempt to prosecute them is one of the most troubling in this entire history. <laughs>